or maybe not. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I am so excited today for these, oops. Okay, I'm so excited today. We're doing my uh, mini raspberry curd tarts. Now, I'm not quite sure if curd is the right word for these, uh, but it's exactly the way I make my lemon curd, but I'm making it with raspberries instead of lemons. <laughs> so uh, I guess it could also be like a raspberry pastry cream, but we're gonna make the crust, we're gonna make the filling, and we're gonna make the meringue toppings. So this is gonna be fun, and we're making these miniature one person size, so they are perfect for Valentine's Day. I'm making a bunch for all of my kids. They're gonna be so excited. So let's uh, make sure that we are getting all the comments. And let's get started. The first thing that we're gonna do is start with our crust. We're gonna do a Pat Sable, a Pat Sable crust. Now, I did a video on all of my crusts a couple years ago, and I got a lot of comments that I was mispronouncing them. So apparently that is something I'm not very good at, uh, which I knew about myself. But you know, thanks everybody for ragging on me a lot. <laughs> uh, anyway, Pat Sable. Uh, and it is a super, super simple crust. So actually one of the more complicated crusts is the American it's Flaky. Crazy, oh. but we are live Volume. Um, okay, great. Yay, comments are working. Okay. Uh, hey lady, how are you? I've missed you. I am good. Irene, hello. Cindy, Micah, Lucy, Larissa. Hi, welcome, welcome. Glad you guys could all join me. Well, let's put that over there. Come on, turn. Don't you love it when your phone won't turn? I'm trying to stay plugged in, but it's not working. Come on, turn. Okay, maybe we're just gonna have to be unplugged and hope I don't die. Okay. Um, so, as I was saying, the American Flaky is actually one of the more difficult crusts because you need to use a pastry cutter and you don't want to over mix it. But the Pat Sable is more like a cookie and it's super easy to make and you can throw it all in your mixer and beat it. Uh, and even though I am going to roll it out, it's a really crumbly crust. It's very much like a shortbread. And so it doesn't necessarily roll really great, but it's a great crust for patting into the pan. So if you don't like rolling out crusts and you're looking for something that you can just press into place, this one is great for that. The other thing I really like this crust for is for blind baking. And that's any time that you're baking the crust without any filling in it, because you're gonna add a filling later that doesn't need to be cooked, like this curd that we're making. Uh, and I like this one because it doesn't shrink. Uh, an American Flaky tends to shrink in the pan if you don't cook it with a filling in it. And so I don't really love using it for those times that I'm blind baking. So this one is perfect for that. So we are going to get started with this recipe. And first thing that we're going to use a hand mixer for this. It doesn't have to be a hand mixer. Um, right. It's hard to like pour all the butter in it. Okay. So the first thing that I do is, oops, sorry. Oh, that's what happened. Okay, so we're gonna put our butter in and our powdered sugar. Um, we're also going to oh, ovens. Oh, look, look, I covered my yogurt. I separated it and out broke. We're gonna add a yolk. Look at this. It's always so sad when yolks break, but delicious and a pinch of salt. So just pinch some salt in there and we're gonna mix that. There we go. Ooh, that kind of powdered everywhere, didn't it? I have like a cloud of powdered sugar now. Probably should, probably should have put the lid on it. Okay, so. This is nice and creamy now. Check that out. And so we're going to add the flour. And I'm gonna add about half the flour. And this time I am gonna remember to put the lid on. And then we're going to beat it. We're gonna get a flour cloud. And we're gonna check the texture because we don't want this to necessarily to get too crumbly. So right now this texture is like a sugar cookie dough. So I'm gonna add a little bit more of the flour. I kind of just eyeball this, but you could always like measure it and do a little bit at a time. 
Now we want this to be just a little bit more crumbly than it is right now. All right, let's look at that now. Uh, Jenny, you love my hair. Thank you so much. How's my shoulder? It's actually doing really great. Okay, so now this is a little bit drier than you would want a sugar cookie dough. I don't know how well that's focusing. Come on, focus. Okay, there we go. Uh, so it's a little bit drier than I would want a sugar cookie. If I was making this a sugar cookie, I would be really unhappy with the final result. It would taste too flowery to me. But for a shortbread crust, this is going to be great. This is just what we want. So we're going to pull this out and get all the goodness from the beaters. You don't want to leave anything behind. And move this out of our way. Ooh! I love my mixer and I love the suction cup so that when you're beating it really high, it doesn't shake. But um, it's always kind of a pain to take off the counters. All right. Well, now let's um, get this out onto the counter. I'm gonna grab a spatula. Whoa. We're gonna scrape all this out. And we're gonna knead it all together. And we're gonna form it into discs uh, and then chill them. So see how easy that crust was? It seriously just uh, doesn't get easier than this one. Okay, come on. Except when it doesn't want to come out of the bowl. <laughs> so now you're going to be able to tell as I knead it together what I meant by this is a little bit drier. So see how it still has a lot of crumbly stuff to it? I'm going to take that off the spatula. Ooh. And um, we're going to like press it together. And you'll notice at first it's a little bit crumbly, but it will start to come together really nicely. You'll be really happy with it. Okay, so because if I was, this recipe uh, usually makes, a, I don't remember if this is my sink, yeah, this is my recipe that usually makes two nine inch crusts, but we are actually gonna make six tarts out of this. So I'm going to do it, cut it into six. So in half. And then in thirds. And it doesn't be perfect because it always makes just a little bit more than you need. And then what we want to do is we want to form it into a disc. So that it'll make it easier to roll out into the right shape later. Did you see how easily that ripped as I was forming it into a disc? Like I said, this is definitely a drier crust. Um, but that is what we were looking for. All right, so I'm gonna form all these into a disc really fast. And now is a good time to answer some questions. Uh, somebody asked about my shoulder. Um, it's doing well, thank you. Surgery has now been, oh, it's now been what? Uh, two weeks since surgery? Three weeks, three weeks since surgery. Um, and it's feeling uh, really good. In fact, so much so that I keep forgetting <laughs> that I had surgery and accidentally lifting things. And I'm not supposed to lift anything for like another three weeks. So, ooh, um, but I am, so far so good. I'm not super worried about it. Um, um, how are you, Misty? You love your hair, the shoulder. You could have used this before you made your mini fruit tarts for Valentine's Day. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I, yeah, I'm taking my son, uh, I'm taking two of my kids, I forget which two, I'm taking two of my kids to a play for Valentine's, so I'm super excited about that. We'll probably go out to eat first afterwards, and then we'll come home and we will all enjoy these tarts together. Actually, you know how everybody has like a favorite dessert? Like my mom's favorite is my, um, my, uh, my dad's favorite is my flourless chocolate cake. My mom's favorite, oh, that would be hard to decide. Maybe my, okay, my mom has a lot of favorites. But my aunt, these are her favorites and she just got engaged. So I'm actually gonna take, I'm making some extras and I'm gonna take some over to her and her fiance to congratulate them on that. That's always fun. Um, so now what we're doing is I'm just taking my, um, my little, why isn't this cutting? I think my screen's dirty. Cut, there we go. 
So I'm just taking some plastic wrap and I'm just wrapping these discs and then we're gonna refrigerate them for about 15 minutes. Uh, so what does everybody else have planned for Valentine's Day this year? I would love to hear. Um, let's see, Michelle, Pamela, hello, Debbie, what are Deb, what brand of mixers are it? A Bosch Universal Mixer. We'll add a link uh, later to it. It's my favorite kitchen tool. Um, my mom had one, my mother-in-law had one. I've always had one. They are the best. I adore them. They're super, super strong. And I have a full series in my blog talking about how much I like it and um, how great it is. Okay, so now I have six discs and I'm gonna put them in the fridge. In the meantime, I'm gonna pull out some discs that I made earlier so we can move ahead and not lose time. And I'm gonna pull out one of my favorite tools that everybody always gets excited about, and that is my pie bag. Woo, I love my pie bag. So what a pie bag is, it opens up, and you can put your crust in here and use it to roll out pie crusts without uh, getting it stuck to the counter. One of my favorite things about it is that you can also, um, as you roll it out, rotate the bag, which is super, super nice. Now, I actually meant to take these out a little earlier, a little bit hard. Hmm. Maybe I'll just use one of the soft ones for an example. It won't be perfect, but at least it won't be hard. <laughs> Nobody wants a hard crust. So ideally you wanna let uh, crusts rest for about 15 minutes in the fridge. Um, if you don't have a lot of time, you can always put it in the freezer for like five to six minutes, but you wanna give that the gluten inside of that pastry time to relax, which I know sounds silly saying things like relaxing about a dough, but um, that's the truth. So. Oh man, it's so weird how soft this one is compared to this one. Um, we will give it a try. And I forgot to plug this microphone back in. Hopefully you guys have been hearing me okay. All right, uh, where can you find a pie bag? Uh, I get mine, I got mine for, as a wedding gift, but I have found them on Amazon. In fact, if you go to my website, I have a shop on Amazon where I link to all of my favorite kitchen stuff. And this one is in there. Or uh, later when I'm sitting down on Facebook, I can respond to your comment with a link as well. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Hello, Myla. Uh, let's see, that looks like a spam comment. Let's get rid of that. Um, okay. So what you do with a pie bag is you want to add a little bit of flour on one side and a little bit of flour on the other side just as if you were going to roll them out on the counter but instead we get to roll them out inside the bag and it doesn't take a lot remember you want to constantly be rotating your dough to keep it in a nice round shape now one of the other things about pastries is a lot of people um, roll their pastries out too thick. And um, actually this on uh, Zoom Netflix, where we were complaining about everybody's pastries and I was like, to me. But so I've been trying ever since then to make my pastries a little bit thinner. So this is how thin I have rolled this one. Whoop. And here whoop, are our mini tart pans. So these are, I want to say four and a half inches. Um, so I roll it out with plenty, plenty of room. Now remember, like I said earlier, this pat supply crust is actually a really easy one to just pat into place. This doesn't, unlike a flaky crust, it doesn't have to be rolled. I like rolling it as a good starting point. It makes it easier for me to get it all to an even thickness, but you can just pull off that sucker down and just pat away until you're happy with it. So I'm gonna take this like that, stick my hand underneath, and flip it over. Now remember how I also said this was a really crumbly dough? Look at that, it's totally just like breaking apart, which is totally normal. So what we're gonna do is kind of press it back into place, 
But again, like I said, I, the reason I like to roll it out first is because then it gives me these little chunks that are the right thickness and it keeps me from getting, uh, from it, keep, it helps me keep my crust really, really even. So that is why I like to do that. If it seems like double the work for you, which I guess it kind of is, you do not have to do that. All right, so now I take these little broken pieces and I just press them into place around the edge. And you want this to kind of go over the edge because we're gonna cut it down evenly in a second. So don't worry if it's like sticking up a little high. And if you have nails like I do now, um, be careful not to break holes in your crust. Uh, and then I have, I'm trying to fix that little crack right there. But again, this crust is just so easy that this is all okay. Um, nothing, there's nothing wrong with this. It's not a failure. You don't have to stress about it. Um, I do like an American flaky crust for a lot of recipes, but, uh, it is, I will, I will be the first one to admit that it's kind of a pain to work with. Worth it? Yes. Kind of a pain? Yes. <laughs> kind of like teenagers. <laughs> Worth it, but kind of a pain. All right. I'm almost done patching this. And I tend to be a little OCD. You do not have to be this OCD. You can stop way before this point whenever you are happy with it. Crusts are one, one of those things that's gonna get filled, so it really doesn't matter. Okay, so another part of crusts that tend to intimidate people is the beautiful edge work. And the great part about tarts so you don't have to worry about that at all. Now there's two schools of thoughts with this. Some people bake it just like this, all scraggly. Then when it comes out of the oven, they use a serrated knife and they cut it even. Or, um, which I think is better if you have a recipe that tends to shrink during a blind bake. But since this one doesn't shrink and it, stay, it holds its shape really well, I'm actually kind of gonna cut it beforehand. So I just take a nice, um, small, sharp knife and I just do, Nice, easy swipes using the actual tart edge as a guide. This is also nice because then you can see it maybe it's a little bit too thick or too thin anywhere. Like it's a little bit thicker over here um, and it's a little bit thinner right here, but I'm not too worried about that. It's actually not bad. All right, we're gonna move on to, I'm gonna do another one really fast. Um, yeah, okay. So now all of this stuff right here, if you were using a flaky crust, you'd have to just toss this because you don't want to over knead a flaky crust. But for this one, it's great because I can just save all these just like a cookie dough um, and I can roll it out one more time. So I'm going to save all the other scraps from the other tarts that I roll out uh, and I'm going to put them together and roll out a couple extra tarts. So that is a nice quality of this. So now I'm going to try one of my harder ones and see how that one goes. Whew, it is definitely much, much, much stiffer. But I want to make sure that I show you one that's been chilled so you're not just seeing one uh, that hasn't. All right, so again, I actually don't even bother zipping up my bag half the time, I will say, uh, because it tends to stick to the crust anyway. So it's not like a huge, oh yeah, this is hard. All right, this is not gonna work. I should have left these out. So when you've chilled one of these crusts, you want to leave them out. If you've chilled, like I've chilled this one. I made this dough a couple days ago. Um, so it's been in the fridge a long time. That initial 15 minutes is all you need, but I had time to make them a couple days ago, so I did. Uh, and so when it's been refrigerated for that long, you do want to give it a little bit of time before you roll it out. So I am going to skip rolling out another one and we're going to move straight to talking about baking it. Uh, so just like a normal pie crust, uh, we're going to, uh, another, any blind bake that you're doing, we're going to put some foil into this. We're going to add some weight. I just use beans and then we're going to bake it at 400 degrees for like 10 minutes. And then we're going to, um, cool it down. Let's see. There we go. So I already have these that I've kind of shaped a little bit just to help save time. What you don't want to do, you want to go all the way to the, oh, I broke that one, stupid nails. All right, let's try another one. You want to go all the way to the edge and you want to press it into place and you don't want there to be um, any air, right? We don't want there to be gaps 
because what that will do is the crust will kind of fill in and it will shrink around those spots. The other thing that you want to be careful with is that you don't, because uh, foil can be sharp, you don't want like a big, huge, jagged edge of foil to push into your crust because that will also um, cause problems. Okay, so I have this nice and smooth around the edges. I'm not jabbing into the crust anywhere. So I have this bag of beans that I just keep over in my in my pie cupboard. <laughs> I have a whole cupboard for all my pies and tart stuff. Um, I just keep this bag of beans in there, and these are my weight beans. They've been baked so many times. I'm not gonna. <laughs> they're not gonna even cook if I try to use them for something else. Um, they're great because beans are super cheap versus super fancy and expensive pie weights. So we're just gonna take this and fill it up. like that. Now some people believe you only have to fill the bottom a little bit, but the times that I've tried to be sparse, because I'm like pie weights are really expensive and there's not a lot of them, so you know I want to be, you want to be sparse. I find that um, I still get issues with a crust where if I really fill it, it works a little bit better. So uh, we're going to bake them and I'll put the recipe away. The uh, For 400 degrees, for five minutes and we're gonna reduce the heat to 350, let it bake for another 10 minutes, and then we're gonna go in and take the foil and the weights out and then bake it for another five. So uh, I will say crust can be a little time consuming, but I think that they're worth it. Uh, so when you're doing a lot of mini tarts, I recommend using a big cookie sheet to put all the tarts on it so that um, you don't have to try to get this little thing in and out with, uh, with hot oven mitts. You can use, this is a lot easier to grab and you don't have to worry about how spaced out all of your um, cooling rack lines. What would those be? The metal rods in your, cool anyway, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. All right, while that is baking, we are gonna get started ooh, on our filling. First, first I'm gonna wipe down the counter because you wanna always stay clean if you can. Okay, so um, for those of you joining us, we just finished uh, the pot sablé crust and it is now baking in the oven or making mini tarts. And now we're gonna make the raspberry curd filling. And the reason that I call this raspberry curd filling is because I make it the exact same way I make my lemon curd filling, but with raspberries. So, get that on. Make sure I'm in focus. Okay. All right, so the first thing that you want is a saucepan. And we're going to, oh, you know what? I'm a big fat liar. We, um, before we get the saucepan, because that's so big and bulky and takes so much room, we're gonna do a cup, a little bit of prep. So, move all the pie stuff that we just did out of the way. I'm going to bring over my tray for the next part. Okay. So for part of this, for a thickener, we're going to use some cornstarch. Now you don't want to add cornstarch to a hot mixture because it's not, it's just going to clump and get nasty. So you actually want to use uh, cold or cool water to dissolve your cornstarch. So first we have cornstarch. Oops. Cornstarch is always such a lovely, messy thing. Did you guys ever play with cornstarch as a kid? All right, so this shouldn't take too long to dissolve in this water, but if you try to go too fast, um, did you guys, were you, I don't know, maybe it was just a me kid thing, I don't know. Um, obviously I do it with my kids because they think it's hilarious, but uh, with cornstarch, you can actually, if you mix it with water and you hit it hard, it like gets hard. And then if you just go slowly, it stays soft and mushy. It always fascinated me. I love science. Obviously as a baker, I do a lot of chemistry. 
So let's look at this. So that's dissolving really nicely. I'm going to make sure that I get all of this stuff because I don't want any dry cornstarch accidentally getting into um, our filling. So I can set this off to the side. I will say this will separate while I'm working on everything else, but once it's dissolved into the water, it's easy to just kind of re-stir up. Okay. And you can see as I'm going fast, it clumps, but if you just go slowly, it stays liquid. I'm actually going to add a touch more water. I think some of my water dissolved. I prepped all these ingredients a couple days ago. There, that's better. See how nice and smooth that is now? Okay. So we're going to set this aside and we're going to beat our sugar and eggs up. So I have some sugar and, oh, my egg yolks are stuck again. Ooh, come on, little egg yolk. There we go. And we're gonna whisk these together. And we're actually gonna add our hot liquid to this um, in a stream once it's warm to temper the eggs and bring it up to temperature versus turning it into uh, scrambled eggs. All right, so this should get a nice light color. It should get really luscious and ribbony. That looks good. All right, so this is ready and now we're gonna get our hot liquid ready to go. So now we're gonna bring this into, um, into the view. Okay, so we're going to add some raspberries. And um, Gabe, what am I making? Hopefully you caught me as I set up. Okay, wow, Jimmy says she loves the pie bag. It's a great time saver. Uh, you got on and you missed the pie bag. It's okay, Arlette. All right, so this is some lemon zest. And my oven just went off, so I'm going to turn the temperature down. And then we're gonna leave that for another 10 minutes at that lower temperature. All right, so now I'm also gonna add some lemon juice. Get a spoon to start stirring. All right. And we want to bring this to a boil. The raspberries will break down and they are going to get nice and liquidy. Jenny says when her son was little, he called uh, cornstarch slurry white boogers. <laughs> that is really funny. Nikki, my cheesecake's totally awesome and you were waiting for this one, thanks. You are so welcome and I'm so glad you like the cheesecake. Which flavor did you try, the classic or one of the flavors like the peanut butter or the lemon or the chocolate and the maple bacon? Um, let's see, don't overdo it, you need my shoulders. Thanks, Jenny, I'll be careful. Um, Laura, Joanne, Lisa, hi, welcome. So glad that you are enjoying this. Okay, so see how liquidy that's getting already? It doesn't take a lot of time for the raspberries to start breaking down. Okay, as soon as it, come on. As soon as we get all the raspberries broken down, we're going to um, add it to the um, egg mixture. Oop, and I'm making a mess. Check me out. This is how awesome I am at this. Hopefully I'm not the only messy chef. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm gonna just move this over to the side so it can keep heating up. And I'm gonna bring this egg mixture in. Now because I'm here by myself and I'm only working with what I got, um, one of my tricks when you only have two hands but you'd like three is to take a paper towel I'm gonna fold it up and I'm gonna get it a little damp. 
get it wet and then squeeze it out so it's just damp and you actually stick it under your bowl and that helps hold it into place so you can whisk it one-handed without it sliding all over the place. Okay. So now I'm going to take some of this warm mixture. Oop, let's see if we can switch camera. There we go. And slowly add the warm liquid and chunks <laughs> into the eggs. This is called tempering the eggs because it's bringing them up to temperature slowly without overcooking them. And once that's nicely mixed together, we're going to add it back into this mixture on the stove. Be careful not to let that paper towel go into the mixture. And scrape it really good so you get everything. I'm gonna add a little bit more sugar. I couldn't add more sugar earlier because the um, the eggs, uh, the last time I made this, because I had forgotten how I made it the first time around. Last time I made this, I was making it again for the first time in a couple years, um, and the eggs got too thick. They didn't stay liquidy, so I didn't add quite as much sugar, just enough to get it nice and creamy. And I'm gonna add the rest of the sugar for this now. Um, I get a lot of comments about some of my stuff being too sugary. Um, I like sweet food, what would George say? Um, thankfully, I'm not a super taster, so I can add as much garlic as I want without being annoyed. Not that I would add garlic to this dish, but like, for example, uh, I love salt, I love sugar. All right, so now this is all together nicely and it's coming back up to temperature and I'm going to add our slurry. So it's probably separated sitting off to the side to so give it another quick stir and we're gonna pour it in. slowly in a nice, um, there we go, nice stream. And then we're gonna keep stirring this until it gets thick. This is also a good dime. Um, if you like, you can bring out a uh, hand blender. That will also help break down your raspberries. Ooh. I, um, oh, hold on, my cord's stuck somewhere <laughs> I got underneath my tray um, I actually didn't have a hand blender uh, until like a year ago and then uh, Braun sent me this one and can I just say I don't know how I cooked without a hand blender before this thing is awesome like seriously amazing I love it so much all right so now we're getting nice and thick check this out we're getting some bubbles. It's thickening up nicely. So now we just want to bring it together and that's why I like the hand blender. It just keeps it cohesive, breaks down any large chunks, smooths it out. And don't put it away after this because we're going to use it again um, in a second. All right, I think I got all the big chunks broken down. Ooh, and we are getting some smoke. I can't use my overhead camera right now because there's so much steam. There's my fan. Ooh. If any of you film recipes fast and like, I'm so glad I have this. It saves my cameras. Okay. There we go. All right, let's done this. Look how fast that goes. It really doesn't take much time at all to get a nice thick uh, raspberry curd. Okay, I'm gonna give it just another second. Uh, Arlette looks amazing so far. You don't even care for raspberries. Well, you can actually do this with blackberries or strawberries if there's another berry that you pick, that you like. Or like I said, this is actually based on my lemon curd recipe. So you could turn this into a lemon curd tart as well, super, super easily. Samantha, amazing purple hello. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is nice and thick. So the way that a lot of people tell with pastry creams and stuff like that, how thick it is, 
Why aren't you focusing? Come on, focus, camera. You gotta love when your camera doesn't want to play nice with you. There we go. Um, is they slide their finger down, and if it doesn't come together, then you know it's thick enough. But honestly, I don't really enjoy burning fingers. Uh, you you just you get to the point where you can tell that it's thick enough. Um, if you really test it, what you can do is instead of finger and getting your burn, is you can take like holds really well it doesn't come back together you know it's thick enough okay let's turn this off now we're going to bring out another with as I said this is as many of the as I can this is also really warm so I'd suggest uh, putting something down for temperature wise. All right, I'm gonna pour this over it. I'm gonna scrape it out and get everything. Um, now it's not gonna look like it's going through yet. It's gonna look too thick, but we're gonna work on it and it's all gonna go through. You don't wanna stop it too thin or you're gonna end up with a really runny tart on the other side. So you do want to make sure that it gets thick enough. Now let's get this hot, uh, hot plate out of the way for a second. And our tarts are ready. So I'm going to move this off to the side. And by tarts, I mean the one that we did. <laughs> okay, so these aren't completely done yet, but they are at the stage that we can pull out the beans. So that is what we're going to do. So usually I just open my oven door, pull these out a little bit, and then do this. So just carefully kind of pull it away. If you pull too fast, you could actually break, um, break your tart, and you don't want to do that. Okay, so I've made sure that all the sides are coming. And I grab the four corners and I just pull it up like that. See how beautifully that has blind bake? So now we're going to put it back in the oven to get that inside nice and golden. And we're going to put that in for like another five to seven minutes. Okay, so let's bring our curd back. And I'm gonna lift that up. You can see it's starting to drain already. And I'm just gonna use my spatula and work this. See how thick those seeds are at the bottom? They kind of stop the actual, what we're going for from going through. So you wanna just move those seeds out of the way. It just takes a little bit of time to get all the good stuff out. And some seeds will go through. Don't stress too much about it. Raspberry seeds, of course, are edible. Um, we just want to make this a pleasant experience so we don't want it to be too seedy. Uh, Maria, can you change out the cornstarch for gar gar for thickness? I have never tried that. You can definitely try it and tell me how it works out. I, uh, I love cornstarch. I use it a lot for a lot of things. I think it's a great ingredient. Uh, wow, it looks so good. Thank you so much. Can you make it with currants? Um, I have not tried to make it with currants. Uh, it might just change. You might have to change some of the amounts, obviously, depending on how liquidy your ingredients are will, you know, affect. Okay, so check that out. Look at all those seeds that we've saved ourselves from eating. Okay, no, but we're not done yet because check out the bottom of this and all of that goodness is still stuck on the bottom. I'm gonna scrape that off and get that in there. There we go. I don't wanna leave any of the good stuff. And now we're gonna add some cold butter that I've cubed up. 
the little cubes. It was cold when I got it out to prep. <laughs> it's a little bit on the warm side now. Okay, and then some um, whipping cream. We are going to stir this now until it all comes together. And this is when I like to bring that uh, hand blender back out. Look at how well it brings that together. Melts the butter really fast. All right, makes it go way, way, way faster. So as long as I have it out and I already have it dirty for the filling, super easy to just add at this point. All right, and now we're going to chill it. We're not going to put it in the pie pans yet because we do want we want the pie pan the we want the tart blind bake crust to be cool and we want our filling to be cool before we start assembling this together. So I'm going to take some plastic wrap again and. Um, you don't just want to cover the ball like this because your curd will end up getting a skin. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're pressing it down and touching the top. And yes, you will lose some of your top uh, when you take it off. You can use a spatula and scrape a lot of it back in, um, but it's going to be a lot less than you would have lost to a skin on top of this because that, that's way worse. Now, I also take this same uh, filling and I add some, I add it to a little bit of whipped cream and this is the filling that I use for my uh, raspberry uh, cream puffs. Um, I made this all for the, an event for my sister and I just, I, yeah, this filling is so good. So you can leave it as it is and use it as a curd or pastry cream. You can mix it with whipped cream and that creates a lighter, more Bavarian-esque filling and it's delicious that way too. But either way, you want this to totally chill before you do anything with it. So I'm gonna put this in the fridge and get out the one I already made. All right, so I made one a couple days ago, and this is what it looks like after it's chilled. So it's thicker, um, and yeah, delicious, and it's not hot. So we're gonna put that away. And I'll make the final component of this tart. That, um, that is here in meringue. Also, I have a minute icing. Also as um, marshmallow frosting. So this one, you cook the frosting while you're blending it. That's what we're gonna do now. Oh, sounds like our tart crust is done. Let's pull that out and take a look at it. Okay. Check out, it's got nice and golden on the sides now. It's hard and it's ready to be pulled out. It could probably last another minute. It's balancing the outer edge crust versus the inside crust. It's cooked enough at this point though, so I'm gonna pull it out. Leave that to cool. Okay, so I'm going to take away this tray and get this one out. You use a semi double broiler, fake double broiler. So I have a pan of water. And clean up our raspberry mess off our burner. All right, so starting with a pan of water, I'm gonna turn that on and bring that water to a boil. Now, word of warning. Uh, usually when I film, I like to use glass bowls because they don't reflect the way 
silver bowls do. Uh, you do not want to use a plastic bowl, one, because you don't want to put a plastic bowl over boiling water. Uh, and two, you don't want to ever beat meringues, egg whites, in plastic, because it holds on to grease. You want to use metal, copper, the best you have it. Metal's fine, glass, fine, anything that you can get completely grease-free cleaning. So I typically don't like using metal pans and filming because they're so reflective and really like, but well, I made me this. I boiled the water, I put my glass over the top, and, and it broke. Totally shattered. It actually was funny when I put the glass over the boiling water. It was when I poured the egg whites in the craft. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to put this bowl on top of this now because it's going to help our water boil faster. All right, let's. Get my hand eater ready to go. Change my mind. I want some else. Oh, I'm going to use my whisk attachment for my um, brown. Okay. I used to, one of my hand blenders years ago had a whisk attachment and I loved it and I used it all the time, especially for this piece. But um, this hand blender does that one. So. Okay, down my attachment. Plugging my microphone back in. Okay, so we're waiting for this to boil. Uh, and then we're going to add all of our ingredients. So this is great because we're going to do egg whites and sugar and corn syrup and we're going to heat those together. Now the reason for the corn syrup, now remember corn syrup that you get at the store and I like the light caro corn syrup is not the same as the high fructose corn syrup that people are freaked out about for health reasons. Uh, caro syrup is, um, or corn syrup that you can get at the store is great for any, for candy making, for sauce making, caramel sauce, hot fudge sauce, um, and it's great for homemade marshmallows and it's great for meringues and like this marshmallow frosting because it gives it shine, it gives it more strength and it helps with crystallization. So you don't get, um, oh man, I burned my finger really bad earlier today. Um, it helps keep it, keep it from crystallizing so that you don't end up with like a grainy caramel sauce or grainy caramels or grainy nougat or grainy marshmallows or, um, so I really recommend using it uh, if you have it near you. All right, this is almost boiling, so we're gonna start adding the ingredients. So, this is egg whites. And you don't want to, um, I will say, maybe add the corn syrup first, <laughs> because you don't want the eggs to start cooking while you're adding all the ingredients. get all that goodness in there and sugar and then you want to start beating this right away like I said because we don't want to give those eggs a chance to cook and this is uh, the reason this is called a seven minute meringue because you beat it for about four minutes over boiling water and then another three minutes after that. So, I apologize, but this is seven minutes of beating, starting now. So this is another good time. If you guys can hear me, can you hear me okay while I'm beating this? Because if you can, this is a great time to um, answer some questions. Um, I'm glad you clarified the care syrup issue. You love using it, you're so welcome, Nikki. Uh, it'd be great on stone cheesecake or anything. I love this seven minute icing or American meringue or whatever you want to call it um, on pretty much everything. It's so easy to make. I use this for my marshmallow fluff. I put it in ice cream, on ice cream. Uh, I don't really, I'm not really a fan of traditional meringues that aren't as sweet because I, like I said, I have a sweet tooth. I have 20 something sweet teeth. <laughs> um, so yeah, I prefer it. Brian, hello, Donna. You can't wait for the written recipe, Donna. There is a link. Up uh, on Facebook, there's just a link to the recipe, already all written out, it's been on my blog for years. Deb, yummy, and a donut, yes, so good in a donut. 
Um, you can hear me fine. Oh, good. Thank you, Arlette Branson. Okay. So take a look at this now. It's already um, a lot bigger. And again, the water's boiling underneath. We, what we don't want is to stop. We don't want to stop beating because uh, otherwise we could scramble our eggs. The eggs could cook to the pan. And then we end up, instead of a nice, smooth, creamy meringue, you end up with a scrambled egg meringue, which has like little chunks of egg. And that's just nasty. So just keep beating it. And turn the temperature down now that it's boiling. And it's going to get nice and white and fluffy. And trade off arms because it does... That's the most naked thing about this. I wish someone would invent like a hand mixer that could like just clip to my bowl so I could walk away. <laughs> you know, I'm so used to using my Bosch, my big stand mixer, but the, this seven minutes is the only negative about this recipe. It tastes amazing, it's totally worth it, and it's super fast, but just, just standing here and holding the mixer for seven minutes straight is so annoying. <laughs> Ah, uh, first world problems. <laughs> All right, it's getting even lighter and fluffier now. I love this recipe so much. Jenny, you can hear me. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. This is looking so good. We're almost done. And you can see it's gotten a lot bigger inside. I think this was only four egg whites, right? Like, this makes so much. I often will half the recipe and just do, um, in fact, for this recipe on the box, down in the description box, I do only use two egg whites, but I have, I'm doubling it for now because I have so many tarts to fill because I made two sets of tarts, the pre-tart set so I could show you the final product. And, um, and then the one that I made to show you how to make it. All right, so this is nice and ribbony and thick and big. And if we test it, we've lost all graininess, and that's what we're looking for. You want that sugar to be totally dissolved. So I'm going to take this off the heat now. Whew. I'm going to move this over. Move this out of our way real fast. Oh, it's always so noisy. And um, you have two choices here, three choices, I guess. You can keep beating it in the warm bowl. It's already in for the final three minutes. Uh, it might take more than three minutes though to get the thickness that you're looking for. You can transfer the mixture to another bowl that's not hot. Uh, and beat it that way, or you can just put it inside an ice bowl to help cool it down. Now, I don't recommend that if you're using a glass bowl, because <laughs> we've already talked about the whole heat and ice and glass thing. But for the metal bowl, this works out. Oh, and you want to make sure that at this stage, because marshmallow or meringue by itself has no, no flavor. So we want to add your flavoring. Um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, a lot of fakey flavory tasting things. So I just use vanilla, uh, but you could uh, use a lemon. You could also use like a raspberry um, if you wanted to. Uh, possibilities are pretty endless of what you want to do here. But this is where you add your flavoring. So right now it's like, not even soft peaks, it's just before soft peaks. It's the ribbony stage. And we want to get to stiff peaks. They do make that. It's called the Salser Kids. Oh, Daryl, I'm not quite sure what, what I said that made you say that. I'm so sorry, I don't get it. Uh, Kristen, you had to walk away for a bit. What is the ring for? It? Yes, it's topping for the tart. You're correct, Kristen. Okay. This is thickening up beautifully. Oh, it's so pretty and shiny. And that's something else that the corn syrup helps with. 
corn syrup also helps your product have a really nice shine at the end. That's another reason that I like using it. You can you make this recipe and other meringues and caramel sauces and marshmallows without it. Uh, but I, I wouldn't recommend it just because it helps so much with the final outcome. Um, in my, I, I think it's totally worth it. Look how much thick it is now. Okay, we're at soft peaks. I'm kind of feeling like the whisk is struggling as this gets thicker. So I'm gonna switch over my hand blender really fast. I haven't used this whisk for this before, so I wasn't sure how it would perform. All right, grab my beaters, but it's hard to beat my Bosch. They actually don't sell these, these Bosch hand mixers in America anymore. It's the saddest thing. Seriously, if I ever see these, uh, if, they ever, if they ever are sold in America again, I'll buy like five because this one is dying and it breaks my heart. If you ever see one like for sale, buy like five. So worth it. Oh yeah, this is a lot stronger. I can feel it already. So you look at those yellow egg whites and you wouldn't expect it to get this white and fluffy. Can you use lemon zest in your meringue? Jenny, that's a great question. You totally can. Tracker looking good. I agree. Hey, we are looking delicious. Yes, it is. All right. So we are looking to get to stiff peaks with this. Ooh, check that out. I love doing that. It's always so fun. Go a little bit longer. Oh, my arm is hurting. Anybody else? <laughs> Your guys' ears are probably hurting from how loud this thing gets. I wish there was a way to mic me and not the blender better. All right. This is looking perfect. Let's check it out. Whoop. Ah ha ha, look at that. So good. Perfect. Best part is, oh, <laughs> cut, cut. Uh, Tuesday nights, my kids' nights with the dad, which is their dad, which is a nice time for me to do these lives. Um, but at the same time, it means I don't have to fight with anybody for the blenders. Mm, these things are so good. Uh huh. Mmm. Marshmallow, marshmallowy goodness. All right, now we are going to put everything together. So I'm going to bring all the components together. Let's dry this bowl off. Fun. All right, so I pre-made, uh, pre-baked a bunch of tarts so we would have some to work with already. All right, so. So a pie, the nice thing about tarts, good tart pans, is that their bottom is separate from their sides. So if you just push the bottom, the sides come right off. Now I didn't even grease these tart pans at all. The tarts have enough of their own grease. Um, and then if you don't have, like, use your nails. I'm so not used to these things, guys. I still can't decide if I like them. All right. Should, there we go. Have to do is really underneath the pop. Look how this. Can you hear that? Put it next to my mic on. So good. Alright. So let's open up. That just popped off. <laughs> Sometimes they get a little bit stuck, but there. It usually just takes a second to pull that out. And this recipe makes six easily. Um, I was just baking glass, so I'd have cool dough. All right, come on. Depending on how thick you feel, the, fill the tarts. The dough you can actually get more out of, depending on how thick you do your tarts. I actually made all four of these out of uh, three rings. 
I took, I took three of those little circles of dough because remember we made six dough balls at the beginning. I took one dough ball, rolled it out, filled one. Took another dough ball, rolled it out, filled one. Took another one, rolled it out, filled one. And then I took the excess from those three balls and I made the fourth one out of that because they mixed together so well. You can't even tell which one that is. Um, so you could really make eight tarts out of this recipe, um, but then you, you'd have to make sure not to uh, not to fill them too thick. So depending on how full you want, how thin you want your tart crust and how full you want your filling, you can get anywhere from six to eight of these mini tarts. The tart set that I bought comes with a set of six. So six is a nice easy way to go. All right, so now we're going to fill these. Let's take this off. And you can pour and fill or you can scoop and fill. It's kind of up to you. When I'm, when I'm trying to get even amounts, I often find it's easier to do the whole scoop and fill thing. Especially if I'm trying to make sure that I get all six filled, if that makes sense. Okay. All right, looks like I have enough left for two more, so that's perfect. And then you just want to spread this down into it. Oftentimes versus like trying to put a lot of pressure back and forth, if you just kind of jiggle your spoon on top, that helps spread this a little bit. There we go. All right, same thing over here. Kind of jiggle it into those corners. All right, any questions? Now I make this with raspberries, but I would really like to try it with black blackberries. Blackberries are totally one of my favorites, probably because I grew up in Oregon, and they're everywhere there. Um, but blackberries are one of my favorites, and a blackberry raspberry mix would be really good, or even a blackberry raspberry strawberry mix would be really good. This one's a little bit less. Um, I don't know that I would want strawberries all by themselves, simply because I feel like pureed strawberries tend to always taste a little bit um, fruit roll up -y, if that makes sense. Even though I love sweet berries, they just taste a little on the fake side, even without like any extracts or anything like that. Um, so I like mixing berries or for straight berries, I like raspberries or blackberries for this. Okay, so move these out of the way. Or not, can't get my fingers underneath them. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to, um, take our meringue and put it in a piping bag. So I'm using a really big tip. This is an Ateco at 849. Now, grab another spatula. I own so many spatulas. All right. So now for filling a piping bag, you want to fold down the bag and that way you can use the, the hand holding the bag kind of like in a cup shape. And this is going to give you something to work against while you fill it. So spatula. And see I'm kind of pressing that down and in and I'm getting rid of air bubbles as I do that. And about it is see all this edge of the bag is nice and clean still. So I can pull that and I don't have to worry about a huge mess unless, you know, you make a mess. What can I say? I'm talented. All right, and then you decide how much of this meringue you want to add. I just in the middle and create like a shape. And I go around the edge, making sure you can still see the raspberries. And I go up to the top, stop squeezing, and pull off. And that's going to give you that nice. So, go around the edges, start to build to the center, stop, squeeze, lift up. That gives that really pretty point. Uh, I'm gonna add some more meringue to my bag. And like I said, trying to keep those edges clean <laughs> makes it easier to add more later without getting too, too messy. And fill the bag some more. Uh, another tip is if you're not used to squeezing, don't overfill your bags that can be really hard on your hands. All right, so kiss, go around the edges of the kiss, build it up, stop squeezing, pull away. 
And the final one. Okay, look how pretty. Now you can um, serve this just like this with this nice pretty meringue topping if you want, or you can torch it. That's what I'm gonna do. There we go. And you don't want to get too close and you don't want to hold still too long. Oh, this smells so good. You want to constantly be moving your torch so that you don't overcook any part. Those points tend to catch on fire easily, so be careful around those. Mm, and it kind of makes the marine grow. It's so much fun to do and to watch. Hoo -hoo. I have to say, I love having a kitchen torch. It's so much fun. Okay. And you can decide how much or how little you want to torch this. And remember, you don't have to cook the meringue because we already cooked the egg whites and brought it up to temperature when we were heating it as we were making this frosting. So this is just for looks. I get a lot of people complaining that I didn't put this in the oven to bake it to a safe temperature, but that's not what you need to do. We're just giving these color. Okay, what do you think? Here we go. So pretty. Now I will say that when I put it together originally, I would refrigerate it after I add the raspberry curd to the, to the tart and kind of let that um, set a little bit. <laughs> Um, but I didn't want to make you guys wait and I didn't want to make a third layer of all of this stuff, third round of all this stuff. Anyway, so there you go. This is it finished. I'm going to cut one open and we can see the inside. If you guys want, you can see how the crust works. So make it pretty, put on a pretty plate, get this out of the way. Oh. oh. I stepped on my microphone cord and it's connected to my pants, so it pulled my pants down. <laughs> oh, talented, what can I say? Super talented. Okay, let's get this a little bit lower so you can get a better view. They look beautiful, you want one, Javier, I'm so glad. Trucker, did I go to culinary school? No, I am totally self-taught. Um, I always loved food. Who doesn't? <laughs> and um, when we were living in Japan at one point, I uh, I was craving like bagels. And in Japan, they don't really bake a lot. They don't even have ovens in their apartments. And so um, if I wanted something, I had to learn to make it. So that's when I started making my own homemade eggnog. Anything I was missing from the States, I learned to make tortillas, um, eggnogs, um, and then like my grandma grew up in Mexico, so I learned tamales and stuff like that from her. Um, but yeah, really, and then I got into cake decorating, but really it's just, I have, I go to a restaurant, I have something I like, and I'm like, I wanna learn to make this. And I just play with it until I do. What I usually do starting a new recipe is I will go online and look at cookbooks and I'll find like eight recipes for whatever that is, like mushroom soup, for example. And I'll, one, I'll find one that, um, sounds like it has the base that I'm looking for. Like I went to a restaurant, had amazing mushroom soup. I wanted to learn to make it at home. And so I, I gravitated towards recipes that were on the creamier side because this was a creamier pureed mushroom soup. Uh, and I went to about eight and then I look at what they have in common, what their techniques are, and then I create my own and go from there and then tweak it until I'm happy with it. So, but no, I did not go to culinary school. I just enjoy being in the kitchen. <laughs> so I just play until I get it right. Great question. Um, how long have you been baking for? It looks fantastic. I, uh, let's see. It was, we lived in Japan when my oldest was two to three. And this year she turns 18. <laughs> so it's been 15 years since I've really been focusing on cooking and baking from scratch. Um, I got into cake decorating when my third was born and he's almost 14. So, um, been doing that for, I guess, 13 and a half years. So 
I don't know, but I've always been like, I grew up in a crafty creative home. I was a music theater art major, a dance major. And so, um, you know, came from an artsy family. All right, let's check these. Look, look how pretty they look. Oh, okay, background should be pretty. We'll bring our candle a little bit. Do not look at the peanut oil on the other side, the man behind the curtain. Okay. Um, now, normally when you would serve this, you would just serve this at the end of dessert and people would enjoy it, but um, I kind of want to get a nice slice of the middle, so I'm going to get a knife. Siri to knife to help me get through this crust and a little cutting board. So I don't want to cut my cute little plate. All right. Now the meringue is still really sticky. Usually I would make these before people came over. So this meringue is gonna be kind of a pain to cut through. Okay. Let's check that out. Oh, <laughs> my crust is starting to break over there. Uh, I think I probably would have wanted to add a little bit more of the raspberry for my own thing. I have to change the tweak the recipe a little bit to add a little bit more. But there we go. You can see that texture of this uh, soleil cookie crust. You can see the of the marshmallow. What? Now the best part of all the videos when I get to try a bite. It's already breaking over here. Some of this side. All right. The side broke off the bottom so it's a little bit sticky cheers <laughs> mm. so good the crust isn't too sweet the raspberry is so if you want to cut back on the sugar and the filling that's where i would cut on sweetness and this overall tart i would cut back on it in the filling because that's where it's the sweetest mm. and then meringue is perfect so good all right, um, I will see you next week. I have a couple different uh, videos that I'm looking to make, and one of them is comparing all of the different uh, coconut milks because uh, there's no real regulation on the fat content in coconut milks, and so all the canned coconut milks are kind of all over the place. And I have a couple amazing coconut desserts that I love to make, like my coconut panna cotta. And sometimes it separates and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it sets and sometimes it doesn't. And so I am done guessing. I'm going to open like all the different brands of canned coconut milk. We're going to compare how much of that uh, when it separates. We're going to compare the liquid left versus the thickness left and um, pick our favorites. So I think I'm going to do that next week unless you guys have another recipe you'd like to see. I'm super excited about it. Um, if anybody has any questions, I will stay on for a couple minutes, but we are done with this recipe. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the three recipes that we turned into a tart, the Pat Sublet Crest, the uh, raspberry curd filling, and then the uh, American meringue, aka seven minute frosting, aka marshmallow frosting that we put on top. So thank you. And I will, like I said, I'll stay on and answer a couple questions before I leave. Um, sometimes you try to bake, but everything goes wrong and you, but you really like to be in the kitchen any advice for being able to bake something good that's a great question uh a lot of it depends on where you where you live most so cookbooks have editors and they have people who test the recipe to make sure it's good bloggers don't so when you're looking on pinterest for recipes not all bloggers are the same um, some take the time to recipe test uh, and make sure that the recipe works. Some um, just steal recipes from somebody else and put them out there and don't even test them. Uh, so, um, so a lot of the times, don't give up. It might not be you. It might be the recipe. So start with something that you know you can really trust, like a cookbook recipe, because they have so many people testing them before those go live. Um, the other thing is where you live. Uh, all cookbooks are written for sea level 
and blogs should be written for sea level. Like I am a high altitude blogger. So I write my recipes for sea level and then I adjust them for high altitude and then I make them for myself. So I know that about other people's recipes. So uh, one of my jobs is I actually make recipe videos for other food bloggers and they'll send me the recipe and I'll make them. And one of the things that I always do is adjust for high altitude because if I don't, that recipe will fail. So again, it might not be you, it might be the recipe, it might be where you live. Um, so if you are at like 3,500 feet or above, adjust any recipe that you make on the baking side of things. Cooking, not so much, but baking, uh, that it's really, really important. Um, another thing is quality of ingredients. Don't make substitutions for low fat stuff. That just, baking is chemistry. Um, and tweaking stuff like that can really affect it. So I don't know what, what's going on. I'm just brainstorming what technic, what tends to be people's problems. I, I got a question, not even baking question. I got a question about a dip and somebody was like, the dip didn't thicken. It didn't come together. And I said, did you use low fat And they said, yes. And I'm like, well, that's why. So, um, you know, don't start substituting a rest ingredients until you feel really, really confident in the kitchen and you know what you need to balance it out with. Um, another thing is honestly just time. Give yourself time. Um, when you try to rush through a recipe that you're not comfortable with, you're not familiar with, it's really easy to make mistakes and have things go wrong. Um, I read a recipe before I start it. I get out all the ingredients, but then I read the whole thing again. So I make sure that I'm familiar with what needs to happen. I'll even like set out my ingredients in order of when I'm going to add them. So I don't forget, but it happens. Like even today I was making a cupcake recipe video for a client and I got something out of order and I tossed it and started over again. Um, Honestly, it's better to fix a mistake when it happens by starting over and doing it the right way versus trying to, anytime I have ever cake decorating all this stuff, anytime I'm like, oh, I made a huge mistake. Oh, well, I'm gonna try to compensate for it in another way. It always ends up taking me more time and more effort to fix it than it would have been to just start over and do it the right way. Um, so I don't know if any of these things are helping. Um, hopefully it does. Um, but a lot of it is just practice, practice, practice. Um, don't give up. Um, and try an, if one recipe doesn't work, try another recipe because oftentimes it's not you. Uh, you have a recipe for coconut milk called Coconut Lush. Anything coconut, I'm on board with. Sounds good to me. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Have you done tiramisu? I actually cannot stand the smell or taste of coffee. And so I, I can't do tiramisu. I'm so sorry. I could do a hot chocolate version. <laughs> Um, question, um, uh, do you have any recipes with goat's milk or goat cheese? Um, I do. I have a Mediterranean stuffed burger that I use goat's cheese for. It's not one of the is ingredients that I have a ton of experience with, but I do like it and I would like to definitely work with it more. Uh, Lucille, you want the recipe? It is, uh, you're on Facebook, so it's in the description box. There's a link to the recipe on my blog and you can print it and go from there. June, uh, will this be in your videos? You missed it. Yes, my, all my live videos just stay in my Facebook and YouTube feed, so you can always find them and rewatch it. Um, and then I also put them on my blog. Sorry that I missed you. Um, I'm still trying to find the perfect time to go on Tuesdays, so let me know if this time, this was, I started at six mountain time, a little bit later than I normally start. Let me know if this works for you or if you would like it a little bit earlier or a little bit later. Um, I'm trying to, I've been playing with times the last couple of weeks to see if we can find one that works best for as many people as possible. Um, you have no idea what kind of coconut to milk, milk to use for the coconut left, so you'd like some good advice. Yeah, um, I have, again, I haven't done the full test, but from reading online and reading other people's tests, uh, there's a couple brands that um, tend to work better than others, so I'm excited to test that for myself. So come next week and just check that out. Uh, Daryl Muir glaze on a buttercream cake. Is it possible? Does the frosted cake have to be frozen? Asking for a friend. Um, you know what? I actually have never made a mirror glaze cake. That's one of those things that's on my list of things to do. Um, I would say from everything that I've read and researched on mirror glaze cakes, learning to do it for myself. Uh, I don't know that it has to be completely frozen but it does have to be chilled colder than like a typical fridge is gonna get it. An industrial fridge would be a good temperature or like my fridge that's in my, my, in my garage right now. So it's kind of almost as cold as a freezer. Um, but I would say it, it's worth freezing for like 10, 15 minutes before you put the glaze on it, just to make sure. 
Um, it also depends on how, how hot your glaze is, how much you've let it cool before you put it on the cake. But I would definitely want it more on the frozen side as much as possible, uh, as, as much as it's possible for you to get it that cool. But I have a full size freezer so I can keep cakes in there. But I also never recommend refrigerating a cake. Refrigerating any baked goods is a huge no-no. Cupcakes, breads, uh, cakes, because what a fridge does is it slows down the process and it ends up drying out whatever you put in there and things that are prone to drying out anyway, like breads and cakes, it just sucks the moisture out of them and then you're left with a dry, dry, nasty cake. Um, so freezing cakes, because it stops the process completely, that will keep your cake from drying out. It will keep it moist on the other end or leaving it on the counter, of course, is a great way to go for that. Um, so yeah, I don't recommend for refrigerating cakes anyway, so I would always go on the route of freezing personally. Um, uh, have you ever used almond milk in any of your recipes? I am a dairy fanatic. So I just, I use whole milk for everything and I've never really used a lot of milk substitutes. And like the coconut milk I'm talking about is canned coconut milk versus cartoned coconut milk. Cartoned coconut milk is more like a milk substitute, like almond milk is and soy milk is and stuff like that. It's thinner and I do not use that in recipes. Canned coconut milk is a totally different thing, even though they're called the same things, totally different ingredient. And that's what I use in cooking and baking and sauces and curries and stuff like that. Um, but almond milk, I haven't other than, I haven't, I haven't used it at all. I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of like basic full fat butter, full fat cream cheese, whole milk. Um, and because I don't have any allergies, I haven't experimented on much on that side of things. But um, if you have a recipe that you're looking at getting created for you, or if you have some questions about it, I'm, I'm always looking to learn more about everything. Um, have you made pavlova, please? Oh, can I make pavlova? I can, that's a great request. I will put that on the list for this year. Have you made cannoli? Um, I have. It has been a very long time. It's one of those things that I made once and because it's not something that I just like love, I didn't make it again, but that would be a great one for a video. So that I will add that to the list. I'm making the list for this year right now of all the videos that I'm planning on making. So I love all the suggestions that you guys can give me. So I can do that. Uh, a hot chocolate version <laughs> of tiramisu. I, I will try that because I've always wanted to try tiramisu, but um, I had to make a, I had to add some coffee to a client's recipe today and oh I thought I was gonna lose my cookies. I can I can't even walk down the aisle the coffee aisle at the grocery store. Uh, coffee and bananas. Mm -mm, can't do it. I actually yeah can't do it. Can't do bananas in any way shape or form. Uh, thanks good get a try. Let me know what you think Daryl. Um, I think I got all those questions. You missed the watch on how to make the meringue topping. It's super easy. It's an American meringue. And so you actually are doing like a double broiler over water and you're cooking the egg whites and the sugar and the corn syrup together while you're beating them until it's nice and fluffy. Take off the heat, heat beating it, and, uh, and then you have your meringue. And because you've already cooked it, you just have to toast it to get those really pretty toast events. So for those of you coming and missed it, this is what we made, the really pretty, this is, this is a that's like a uh, shortbread crust. This is a raspberry filling, which you could substitute out for like blackberries, or you can just make it as a lemon curd, which is where the recipe originally comes from. I've done uh, blood orange as well, and that one turns out really nice too. Uh, and then this is an American meringue or seven minute frosting topping on top. And I like it rather than a classic meringue because it's um, a little bit sweeter and tastes just like marshmallows. And this is what the inside looks like. So good. This is one of my favorite crusts to make. I love it. All right, I think, uh, I think I'm all caught up on questions. So thanks you guys for coming. I will see you next Tuesday. Keep adding suggestions and I will add them to my calendar for the year as I plan out what I'm gonna make in the lives and in the edited videos. Um, all right, uh, the Spanish name for that. I don't know, I have your, I will have to, Google that. <laughs> Google, Google has the answer to everything. Uh, uh, do a live with experimenting with it. Good suggestion. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's everything. So thank you again for watching. Happy Tuesday. Happy early Valentine's Day. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful week and enjoying being with your loved ones and enjoying everything pink and red because really 
that's the best part of this week is eating everything pink and red. I make my um, chicken Alfredo pizza, but I dye the dough pink and I dye the Alfredo pink. So we have pink heart shaped chicken Alfredo pizzas. We do it every year. It's my favorite thing. So um, have a wonderful day and thanks for watching.